Good afternoon to um, everybody. My name is Sunita Basnit, uh, Head of School of Business at the British College. I'm leading business and management program in undergrad, undergrad and postgraduate level uh, that consists of BBA, MBA and uh, MIBM program and also the hospitality program BHM. Um, I'm glad to be starting this session in presence of our faculty members, our executive principal, Mary Bischoff, our associate deans, Yamal Raj Bandari and Arun Joshi, our program leaders of various programs, um, and of course, the staff of TBC, thank you for being here. And faculty members especially who are here, thank you for arranging your time in this afternoon. I know your busy schedule, but um, thank you for uh, being able to be part of this session. Before I provide a brief bio of Dr. Helen with us, um, I would request our uh, executive principal, Professor Mary Bischoff, to welcome her and the faculty members. Uh, Mary, over to you. Thank you, Sunita, um, and thank you for, for inviting me to this seminar. And I'm really sorry that I can't attend the whole seminar, but I was very keen to, um, to join and, um, and listen to the beginning and also to welcome Helen. And um, in particular, because um, Helen and I are both principal fellows of the Higher Education Academy, and um, it's through the networking sharing list that this link has really come about. And I think that really shows the value of something like the Higher Education Academy Fellowship Scheme and the networks it provides. And not just obviously that scheme, there are a number of other ones as well. But using those networks can lead to all sorts of interesting collaboration and research. So thank you, Helen, so much for agreeing to do this. Um, obviously, UE is, is a, a long time partner of uh, the British College and, uh, and I'm a previous um, employee at UE for, for a number of years as well. So I'm delighted that you're able to, to give us the time today um, and uh, look forward to hearing all about it and uh, um, wish you well in your um, next, uh, next uh, um, hour or so doing this uh, particular seminar. So thank you very much, um, very important subject and I look forward to, to hearing more about it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for arranging your short time with us. Um, before uh, we start the session, a very few housekeeping rules uh, just for FYI. I uh, request everybody here to either switch off with the mobile phone or keep it in a silent mode. Um, anyone who wishes to take part in the session, please raise your hand. Of course, there is a Q&A session at the end um, uh, after the session of Dr. Helen. So there we can interact and exchange the ideas. Uh, please raise your hand or drop your queries in chat and I should be able to pick it up. Uh, with that, I will warmly welcome and heartily welcome Dr. Helen. Dr. Helen, thank you so much for your time for today's session. Um, and, uh, you know, the moment we started planning um, the, the gesture that you showed uh, for this entire session and the entire faculty development plan, it's just so kind and very helpful for, for TBC at our level. Thank you so much. Uh, very brief profile of um, Dr. Helen for uh, everybody's information. Uh, Professor Helen King's career in educational development spans over two decades and has included leading roles in UK-wide learning and teaching enhancement projects. Um, as an organization and as an independent consultant, she is collaborating with colleagues in the UK, USA, and Australia. Um, in her institutional roles, she is currently a deputy director of academic practice at the University of West of England, who is also a partner university for a British College for BBA and MIBM program. Dr. Helen's current research is exploring the characteristics of expertise in higher education teachers. She holds a senior fellowship of the Staff and Education Development Association, a national teaching fellowship, principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and honorary associate professor at the University of Queensland. Her work on expertise together with contribution from a range of other colleagues has recently been published in the book, Developing Expertise in Teaching for Teaching in Higher Education. And that is um, some of the gist of the book itself will be the topic to explore today from the side of Dr. Helen. Um, in her own words, 
uh, for the concept of developing expertise in teaching in higher education. This concept of expertise has a deep and broad theoretical and empirical foundation in wide variety of profession. This session of Dr. Helen in her own words will briefly outline the generic characteristics of expertise and then discuss what this might look like for teaching in higher education. And after the presentation of Helen, there will be a Q&A session uh, and a discussion which will critique the model and information that she will be sharing with us that will hopefully enable participants to make a meaning out of it, the context and other implications for teaching and personal development. With that, I would like to hand this over to Helen. Helen, please. Lovely. Thank you so much for the for the introduction. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for everybody for coming along for sparing the time. Um, really looking forward to sharing my ideas with you um, and hearing your ideas back as well. Um, as Sunita said, uh, there'll be lots of opportunity afterwards for uh, discussion and questions. Um, but please do pop things in the chat box as we go. Um, also, partway through my presentation, um, I'm going to ask you to, to give us some give me some of your thoughts in the chat box as well so just to kind of give you an alert for that um, but I'm going to share my screen as I've got a PowerPoint presentation um, and I will send this presentation um, so that you can have a copy of it because there are some links in there that you might want to see so I will make sure you get a copy of that um, afterwards okay so just changing it to slideshow format there we go hopefully that's all good. Can you give me a wave, Sunita, if you can see that? Yep, yep, I can see That's that. Good. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, so as I said, we've got plenty of time afterwards for discussion and questions, but if anything arises afterwards, um, you're really, really welcome to drop me an email. My email address is on the screen there. Um, if you use Twitter, um, you're very welcome to, to tweet. Um, and uh, my uh, username is there as well, um, along with my um, my website address if you want more information at another time and as I said I'll be sharing the PowerPoint presentation so you'll be able to see that directly so you don't need to to make notes now so I was introduced to the extensive expertise literature when I was working on ways of thinking and practicing in the disciplines and it led me to start exploring whether the concept of expertise might offer a useful discourse as an alternative to the notion of excellence, which is used um, prolifically, uh, certainly in the UK, um, but also internationally. Now, the difficulty I have with the term excellence um, is, first of all, it's self-defined. So there isn't really um, a research base underneath it to define what we mean as excellent teaching. Um, often people will say, well, it's, it's defined by the criteria for excellence awards, but that's a bit of a circular argument, argument really. Also, if you look at the Latin derivative of, of the English word, um, it means it comes out meaning sort of lofty, outstanding, beyond. So it's not necessarily something we can all achieve because we can't all be above average. We can't all be outstanding. So in that sense, it's a bit exclusive. It's not available to everybody. And also it feels like it's a bit of a, a point to be reached. You know, I'm now excellent. Um, so a bit of a kind of, there's, there's a lack of sort of dynamism there. And certainly in the UK, we find that excellence is measured by outputs. So our student outcomes, how are they performing? How satisfied are they? And that doesn't really help in terms of developing ourselves as teachers. By way of contrast, the term expertise, I feel, is, is much more accessible and available to everybody. There's a depth of literature um, that provides um, a framework for understanding what expertise is all about. The literature covers a whole range of, of professions and disciplines, as well as looking more broadly about the generic ideas of expertise. Also, if we look again at the, the derivation of the word coming from the Latin, it comes from a word that means to try. And it's also the origin of words experience and experiment. So it's much more about a process and it's something that we can all um, embark on. It's a journey, a sort of road to expertise that's available to everybody. And when you look at uh, the research into expertise, it's very much characterised by inputs. 
So in our case, what the teacher is doing, how they're doing it, how they develop, how they enable their students learning. So thinking about expertise helps us to think a lot more about what it is that we're actually doing ourselves to support our students. I've mentioned it's a more of a dynamic process um, and because it's an, always an ongoing process, it provides agility and flexibility to react to change. And also, I think there's an aspect of humility about expertise, uh, certainly if you look at it through the literature, because expertise is considered, considered as domain specific. So we might be an expert in one area, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're automatically expert in another area. And also, in order to really do our jobs well, we, can't, we, we need to um, employ the expertise of others. So if I take the example perhaps of a surgeon, they might be a very expert surgeon, but they're not going to be able to perform their surgery to their highest ability without a team around them, without the anaesthetist, without um, assistance, without a nurse. And so expertise is very much about saying, you know, I have my area of expertise, but I need your areas as well. I need other people's skills in order to make the most of what we're doing. So that's my, my rationale for why um, I like the idea of expertise um, rather than excellence. So what I'm going to do is just talk through um, the generic character expert, characteristics of expertise um, as they're seen in the literature to give you a sense of, of what do we actually mean by expertise. And I've uh, categorised these into three main areas. Um, and once I've talked through this, I'll then look at what does this mean for teaching in higher education. So the first category of, of characteristic is, is perhaps the most obvious one. It's about high performance based on knowledge and skills developed through study and experience. And as I said, it's generally domain specific. So you have expertise in one area doesn't necessarily mean you automatically have expertise in a related area. There's then um, a whole load of characteristics related to ways of thinking and practicing. And this is more intangible than the actual knowledge and skills that you have. Um, it relates to pattern recognition, problem solving, um, things like automation of skills. So I'll give you some examples to give you a sense of, of kind of what we mean by this. So in terms of pattern recognition, um, experts are able to perceive meaningful patterns in their domain of expertise, which results in the ability to perform skills faster than novices. And the classic example of this is within chess, um, where research has been done extensively. Uh, the classic research was um, used um, chess masters and novices. And they showed them uh, a chessboard with the pieces arranged as they would be in a game. They looked at it for a few seconds, the chessboard was taken away and they had to recall the positions of the pieces. And the chess masters significantly performed better than the novices, which we might expect. However, when the pieces were arranged in a way that would not appear in a chess game, so just completely randomly, the masters were no better than the novices at recalling the positions. So it wasn't that they've got superior short term memory. It's all about the patterns and they'd encountered the different patterns so many times through their experience of playing chess that they're able to recognize them and recall them quite quickly, which obviously then helps with uh, their get their playing of chess. And this type of pattern recognition is seen in a, a whole range of other professions and disciplines as well. Um, a number of years ago, I was involved in some research in geoscience education, where we showed some geologists some uh, patterns of geology um, and we showed some novices. And again, the same thing happened. The, the, the expert geologists were much better at recalling the patterns, but only when they were real things that could actually appear within geology. So pattern recognition um, is a really important part of expertise and it's something that's developed really through experience. Experts also have a different approach to problem solving, a kind of qualitatively different approach, which includes taking more time at the beginning of a problem to understand it from various viewpoints before, an attempting, before attempting a solution. 
So my personal example of this one uh, is from when I was learning physics at university. And we had an exam at the end of the year called general physics, which could be on anything at all that we covered. And I used to, to dread this exam because in the individual topics, I would learn the particular equation that we need to, to, needed to know. You know, we were given a problem about that and it was really easy to see or put this number into that equation and it was fine. Unfortunately, that didn't work with general physics because the questions would be much broader. So, for example, I remember there was one question about uh, two aircraft taking off the same point on, on Earth, one going one way around the world, one going the other way um, at the same airspeed, which one would arrive back first? And I was kind of completely stumped by this. I was thinking, oh, you know, what equation do I put in here? I'm, I just don't really know. Whereas if I had perhaps been more expert or thought about it, had more time to think about it, I would have stepped back and had a look at, well, what's going on with the problem here? Um, we've got aircraft traveling around the Earth at the same speed, but of course the Earth's rotating as well, so that's gonna have an impact. And that's an approach to problem solving that experts tend to naturally take when, um, when they have a lot of experience, is that stepping back, looking at the bigger picture um, before then honing in onto the particular aspect of the problem. And then another type of ways of thinking and practicing is an automation of skills. So often when we see people who are particularly expert, so elite athletes or musicians uh, or even teachers that we know, they seem to, it seems to be almost effortless, it's very graceful. They don't seem to be uh, having any problem at all doing their, their sport or playing their music because it's become almost automatic. And for them themselves as well, sometimes they can feel that they're in that kind of moment of flow where they're not even having to think about what they're doing. It's just it's just happening. And that takes many, many hours of experience and practice to reach that point of automation. So then the third category of characteristic um, I've called intentional learning and development. And I want to talk about this um, in a little bit more depth. So many hours of practice are important for the development and maintenance of expertise. Um, you may have heard of the, the sort of 10,000 hours of practice um, that's often uh, talked about. Um, and yes, it does take a lot of time, whether it's exactly 10,000 hours, um, it's probably much more variable than that. Um, but actually, it's not just any practice. Now, by practice, we mean it could be rehearsal, as in practicing the piano, but it also can be the repetition of a professional activity. So Schoen mentioned that professional practitioners encounter similar situations again and again. So whilst we might not rehearse our teaching necessarily, we do practice it in the sense that we are often either repeating the same session or simply you know, practicing um, our skills of teaching. But as I mentioned earlier, simply clocking up hours of experience is not enough to develop expertise. This simply means that you become very good at doing your one particular thing in a very particular way. So actually practice doesn't necessarily make perfect, practice makes permanent. And in addition, cognitive science shows us that we don't learn simply by having an experience. We must process and analyze that experience. Think about it, what worked, what didn't work. So we must reflect in order to learn. So expert practitioners continually engage in a more deliberate practice, as Ericsson put it, um, also characterized as progressive problem solving. So rather than just mindlessly repeating, they identify areas that perhaps aren't working quite so well, where they might improve, or where they might just do things better, or perhaps they might be interested in doing things differently, being creative and innovative. But it's about identifying those particular areas um, and working on them, drawing on feedback um, and other evidence to inform their practice. So just give you an example uh, of me playing the piano. So I've played the piano since I was about four years old. 
um, had lots of lessons. I worked my way through the various grades um, and I had reached a, a reasonable level of competence. But um, I don't perform, um, I play just for myself um, and I'm really happy with that level of competence. When I play a piece that's got a, a difficult bit in it, I tend to skip over the difficult bit um, and I will never improve it because I do that every single time. I just either miss something out or just stumble my way through it. But that's OK because I, you know, I'm not interested in, in improving. If I did want to improve, rather than just playing the whole piece again and again and continually stumbling over that difficult bit, I would focus down on the bit I couldn't do. I would play it really slowly, I'd take my time on it um, and hone that bit so that I could then move on and play the whole piece um, much, much better. So that's what deliberate practice is. It's, as it says, it's being very deliberate about how we're practicing and how we're learning and developing. And I think that this idea of a very intentional, deliberate learning and development is summarised quite neatly by um, Perkins' suggestion that expertise is actually just a process of proactive competence. So looking at, looking at it in terms of, of teaching, um, I did some research uh, with nine UK national teaching fellows using their award as a kind of proxy for expertise. And I interviewed them and talked to them about how they learned to teach and how they developed their teaching. And when they talked about the development of their teaching, um, they didn't say oh, I went on this course or I did this qualification. They talked about a narrative of how their teaching has changed over time. And only with prompting did they then articulate how other things such as conferences, conversations, literature, feedback and so on. Only then did they um, talk about how those things had informed that change. So their approach to developing their teaching looked very much like a kind of deliberate practice or a progressive problem solving. They would identify things that weren't working quite so well in their classroom and they would find ways to do it better. Or they might be really interested in a new innovative approach and would explore how that might help with their students learning. Now, of course, evolution of practice isn't always um, a smooth or a linear process, and sometimes it can take huge leaps. Um, that's certainly something we've seen over the last few years um, with the COVID pandemic, many of us then having to go and teach online um, at very, very short notice, and teaching has evolved really quite quickly. Um, and certainly for me, being able to do this kind of presentation um, across across the world um, is, uh, you know, one of the sort of the, the benefits that has arisen from that uh, sort of change in how we do things. But of course, for, for mostly our kind of evolution of teaching can take place more slowly, um, but we all have our own personal journey. Um, our teaching all ev evolves in our own different ways. So when thinking about professional development, um, I like to think I have this, this definition. Um, I believe you've seen a uh, being shared a copy of the paper that this has come from. So rather than thinking of continuing professional development as a course or a workshop or a conference, a training session that you go on, I think it's much more about a self-determined and deliberate or purposeful process of evolution of your teaching that's informed by evidence gathered from a range of activities. So the important message with all of this is that professional learning and develop doesn't development doesn't happen automatically. It has to be considered and planned. But also, I think it should be considered as part of the everyday activities of our teaching preparation and delivery. It's not an add on that we do in our spare time. Most of us don't have any spare time to be doing that anyway. And professional learning and development isn't just about going on courses and gaining qualifications. It's much more about being curious about what's going on in your classroom and reflecting, talking, exploring how things might be improved. Now, I mentioned that expertise is domain specific. 
So you might have expertise in teaching in a particular classroom environment, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can easily teach in another environment. In a sense, you have to develop a new expertise. So a few years ago, um, I bought a banjo and I'd never played one before, but I had played a guitar, which is similar. And I understood concepts of music, chords, notes and rhythms. So I already had um, experience from something similar that I could build on. But I also sought out the expertise of others through books, videos, a teacher, and I got involved with communities of other learners as well. And I learnt by doing, by engaging in deliberate practice. Now, I would know, certainly not call myself an expert um, now, but I'm certainly moving on that journey of expertise. And I think it's the same for teaching in a new environment or with new content or a new cohort of learners. We've got um, our basic teaching skills that we can build on. The principles of good teaching pedagogy are the same. And we can identify resources and people who can guide us. We can share ideas with colleagues, maybe engage in peer observation, and we can learn through doing and through teaching and experiencing various environments as learners. And I think this opportunity to be, um, experience things as learners is actually quite useful. I have a classic example from my own teaching. So I teach lecturers um, and effectively teaching, teaching how to teach on a postgraduate certificate. And they often complain that their own students don't turn on their cameras when we're in an online lesson or they don't engage as much as they'd like them to. But interestingly, when those lecturers are being learners themselves, they often behave in very similar ways. So I kind of alert them to this and sort of say, well, why are you doing this now you're in that role as a learner? And so we learn together about teaching through experiencing what it's like to be a learner. So there's many different ways that we can learn and develop our own teaching practice. So just as a, a refresher, so these are the three categories um, that I've, I've um, drawn out around generic expertise. So high performance based on knowledge and skills, ways, <coughs> ways of thinking and practicing, and intentional learning and development. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I talked about professional learning, intentional learning and development in terms of our teaching practice. So what do those other categories look like? So the knowledge and skills. So I suggest that the knowledge and skills required to teach in higher education might be characterised as Shulman's pedagogical content knowledge. So if you like, this is the sort of how to teach and what to teach needs to come together. So it's the interaction of knowledge and skills from both your subject area, but also from pedagogy. And this comes from experience, from study and an understanding of good practice. What makes higher education different, I think, from, from other levels of education, though, is that teachers might experience um, an identity wobble board. And many thanks to, to Rachel Wood uh, in law at UWE uh, for her idea of this wobble board concept. By this, we mean that in higher education, we often have multiple roles. We're subject specialists, we might be researchers, might even be professional practitioners, administrators, but also teachers. And all of these different roles are kind of interacting or, or kind of bumping up against each other in this pedagogical content knowledge. And so an expertise approach might be one where we find ways to resolve this and conceptualise our role as a more of an integrated whole. So I'd like to explore now this idea of ways of thinking and practising. Uh, and this is where um, I'd really welcome your comments and ideas in the chat box. Um, and there is no right or wrong answer here. It's really kind of what your own perceptions are and your own opinions are, you know, be really useful. So I'd like you to think of a teacher. It could be in higher education or it could be any other level or any other context. You know, it might be a music teacher um, or a ballet teacher, uh, or it could be a teacher that you've had yourself. 
um, or it could even be yourself. Now, if they are a good, experienced expert teacher, of course, they'll have their subject knowledge. Um, they use appropriate teaching approaches to help learning. And um, hopefully they engage in their own learning and development. But what are the other intangible qualities and characteristics? When you observe or experience their teaching, what do you see or feel or experience that makes you think they have expertise? Or perhaps from your own experience as a teacher, what are those aspects of your teaching that goes beyond the subject or pedagogical knowledge and really makes a difference to your students' learning? So I'd really welcome if you've got any ideas around that, just pop some notes in the chat box. So what do you feel? What does it feel like to experience an expert teacher? I'll give you a few moments to, to type some thoughts. So to be organised and structured. So absolutely, yeah, there's a sense of um, when you're in that, that situation, there's a sense that they're sort of, um, they've got a sense of where, where the lesson is going, um, how it fits in with the bigger picture. Understanding the audience, absolutely. So teaching is very much a, a two-way thing. We don't teach at our students or to our students we help them learn and we're working with them. So we need to understand who they are, and develop that, that sort of relationship and understanding. Connection with the students, absolutely. Some sort of sense of rapport. Um, you want to feel that that person who's teaching kind of really cares about you and, and your learning. Very welcoming, absolutely. You get a sense of, um, you, know, you feel comfortable in that space because you feel you should be there because you've been welcomed. Definitely. Acknowledging learning pace of students. Absolutely. Of course, all our students are, are different. We all learn at different paces. Um, and we need to be aware of that and be able to manage that. So some really nice things here around relationships, rapport, being very aware of who the people are that you're with. That's fantastic, thank you. Do feel free to continue to, to pop some more ideas in and of course we can explore this later um, through the Q&A um, if you're interested. So I think that this third characteristic of expertise, the ways of thinking and practicing, is perhaps the least explored within a higher education context. What is going on within the teacher when they practice their craft of teaching? What's the problem solving, the pattern recognition, the automation of skills which enable flow? We see these, as you said, coming out through the um, welcoming environment that they enable, through the structure and organisation, through being approachable, through rapport. And I've characterised this as artistry of teaching. And it's often those intangible characteristics, it's reflection in action, intuition, improvisation in the classroom, being able to respond to unexpected questions or situations. It's authenticity. So really being, being yourself, not trying to be somebody else um, or emulate somebody else, but being yourself. It's rapport. And you can recognise these things in expert teachers um, that perhaps are not visible with novices or even experienced non-experts. And I think these are perhaps the more human elements. And they're often ones that we neglect when we're thinking about how we support newer teachers. We tend to focus very much on the pedagogy, the skills that they need. And whilst these, this artistry of teaching can emerge from experience, I think we can also nurture it within our um, less experienced colleagues through mentoring and professional development.
So Schoen describes competence as the ability to follow routines and respond to known situations. But teaching is rarely routine. However well organised you are, something unexpected almost certainly will happen. So as Schoen says, let's, it, let's us search instead for an epistemology of practice, implicit in the artistic intuitive processes which some practitioners bring to situations of uncertainty, instability, uniqueness and value conflict. Similarly, Bereiter and Skardamalia, who discuss the idea of pro progressive problem solving, they suggest that the expert addresses problems, whereas the experienced expert carries out practice routines. So teaching is more than a pedagogical checklist of, of routines, but actually there are, are things going on in the classroom um, that we need to problem solve uh, on the fly, as it were. So to continue um, the music analogy, Teaching is not quite like being in a note perfect string quartet, playing in front of a quiet, respectful audience in a well managed auditorium. I think sometimes it's much more like being part of a jazz band. So we're playing the tunes we know, but we're improvising and learning together with our audience. So just to, to summarise, so this is what I suggest might be the characteristics of expertise of teaching in higher education. So it's our pedagogical content knowledge, professional learning in the form of intentional evidence informed evolution of teaching. And we have this idea of artistry of teaching. <clears throat> now, this model isn't intended to, to constrain the definition of expertise um, and rather it's a starting point for conversation and for considering our own practice. So I'm always really keen to share these ideas and have them critiqued and discussed um, and explored further. But why is it useful to think about expertise? You know, why can this help us? I think the professional learning aspect of it for me is perhaps one of the most important aspects and sharing your ideas and approaches with your colleagues and learning about their approaches, I think is a really important aspect of professional learning. And when you are considering other people's approaches, think about how you might adopt or adapt them to make them authentic to you. And what's your artistry that you bring? And how can you continue learning from each other and developing your expertise? Now, as I said before, we tend to focus on to teach but there are many other tacit things going on in our ways of thinking and practicing as teachers so when you're thinking about your own professional development or supporting others think about all of those dimensions of expertise not just the knowledge and skills what's also really important is not expertise isn't everything you can be an expert in your own particular area but it's really important that we recognise how other people's expertise can also inform our work. One of the other things I like about expertise rather than excellence is also it's not necessarily always about getting things right, but it's about what you do when things don't work quite so well. You learn from it, you problem solve, and you become flexible and agile and able to do that. And so in times of change, having an expertise approach, I think, is really helpful because you've got that flexibility and agility. You're used to adapting to change rather than being stuck with this static excellence approach. And I think, and, and you know, you've brought this up in the chat box yourselves, expertise is very much about caring. Caring about your students learning enough to spend time to improve your teaching caring for each other, having those respectful relationships and rapport, both with your students, but also supporting your colleagues as well. And so expertise really is much more than just experience. It's much more than just doing the same thing again and again in the same way. And so to finish off um, with a sports analogy uh, for a change, road running is relatively straightforward if you've ever done it. It's obvious where you're going, usually, 
The surface is fairly even and predictable, as long as there's not too many potholes. But after a long time of running in the same way, you can lose flexibility. Your ankles stiffen, your knees can start to hurt, and you can't easily react to changes. You tend to avoid the puddle or the pothole rather than tackling it head on. Running off-road is very different. The terrain is always changing. You need to be prepared for all sorts of weather, particularly here in the UK. And certainly here in the UK, there will probably be mud. And in the case of the English race depicted here, there's dry mud, wet mud, and sometimes cow mud. But the important thing is you're not on your own. You've got other people there to help you and to support you. So developing and maintaining expertise isn't necessarily an easy road, an easy journey. But um, if we embrace expertise through the, the approaches I've talked about today, it is very much something we do as a learning community all together. So just to finish off before we, we move on to discussion and questions, um, I just wanted to, to add to Sunita's kind plug for my book. Um, if you're interested in these ideas, we explore them in much more depth um, in this book. Um, written by myself, but also with 35 other colleagues uh, who contributed to a symposium we had on expertise. Um, there's a variety of uh, perspectives um, internationally exploring those three categories of expertise. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, I do recommend it's, it's some really interesting perspectives. Um, if you're interested in those National Teaching Fellowship uh, research interviews that I undertook, on my website, I've written up summary case studies where there's some really nice examples of how people have developed their teaching, um, particularly thinking about it from a progressive problem solving perspective. And as I said, I will share these slides with you um, so that you can see the links there. Um, and also I have a reference list at the end if you're interested in following up any of those. Um, but for now, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for contributing. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen um, and we can move on for questions and discussion. Thank you, Dr. Helen. Um, indeed, a very insightful information on the topic itself. Uh, well, me as somebody who is an aspiring academician and who's been in the field for the past uh, uh, four plus years, I think I've already noted down some key points on developing expertise in my teaching for years going forward. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. Meanwhile, I would like to request all the faculty members, um, if you are comfortable, wherever you are, to turn your camera on uh, to participate uh, uh, for this uh, discussion round. Um, just a very gentle request. Um, provided you are comfortable uh, to turn the camera on and uh, we can just uh, see if any would like to start with the Q&As or any insights on the presentation shared by Dr. Helen. Okay, yeah, we can see the camera on here. Thank you, great. Uh, right, the, does anyone would like to volunteer, would like to start? Uh, for me personally, um, I think even though it's it's we, we it feels like we just started, but it's already an hour. But you know there are a couple of questions, but I'd like to ask that later. Um, so I'll request uh, if anyone of you would like to start, um, you know, for the presentation shared by Helen uh, for your own areas of teaching and research, please. May I? Sure. Please go ahead, Vanessa. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Helen. Thank you very much. Let me give you a case here. Uh, I myself a case. Uh, I've been, uh, I've come back to teaching after spending 25 years in the corporate world. If, so I worked for a banking system and then uh, after I took the voluntary retirement, I went back to the same old teaching job that I had taken when in my 20s before I went to the bank. And all along, I was trying to gather all expertise that is needed in teaching. 
now, now, in terms of recruiting talents for teaching, keeping them in the professions and developing them continuously, uh, the expertise that you talked about, what are the challenges? Like I'm a drifter and I'm happy that I've come back, okay? But again, at times there are social forces which says, you, you, you are a fool. You gave up the very lucrative corporate job and now you are into the teaching. Now, so how do you handle that so that I, I keep focusing on the expertise that you are suggesting uh, we to uh, go on? Thank you very much. That's a great question and, and something I didn't touch on in my presentation, but is a really important part of all this is around motivation. Um, and that's actually something I'm, I'm keen to explore on uh, further. Um, and we've got another symposium coming up in, in October where I'm really interested in looking at that motivation. Um, because in, in many professions, um, sports, anything you can think of, most people will not continue to develop their expertise. They'll reach a particular level of competence and will stay there. Um, and generally that's fine because it's okay for, it's okay for them it's okay you know if they're teaching it's okay for their students um, and to have the motivation to continue to develop and continue improve is something we often only see in a few people um, and it's to do with motivation it's to do with reward and incentivization um, and so I guess there's there's two aspects to it one is perhaps more of a uh, an institutional wide aspect of how much teaching is valued, um, how you feel you're recognised and valued for what you do. But it's also a personal motivation. Um, you know, it, it's interesting you say that obviously your, your other job was much more lucrative. So what was it that drew you back to teaching? What's the rewards, personal rewards and benefits that you get from teaching your students? Um, and is perhaps being more ex explicit about that and talking more about that. I think we don't talk about enough it, uh, it enough, certainly in, in my institution. You know, we just assume, well, you know, you've come here to do this job, therefore you must, you know, be motivated to do it. But actually everyone has lots of other pressures on them. As I said, you know, some people are researchers, some people are still professional practitioners as well. So what do we need to do to kind of help people to ma maintain their motivation for teaching? Um, I don't necessarily have, have an answer to that, but I think it's a really important question that we need to think about because without that motivation, without being able to prioritise it as an important aspect, um, then, um, you know, we don't prioritise professional learning and develop, development. We don't prioritise developing our expertise. So I'm not sure I've got an answer there for you, but I think that whole concept of motivation is really important. We'll keep exploring about it. Mm. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Vanu, sir. Um, anyone has any question or any insights on this topic? Again, from your own, own areas of teaching and researching. Uh, I can see Sukant, Sukant sir raising the hand. Sukant sir? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, uh, thank you, Helen, for this uh, great for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, actually, uh, you have uh, summarized the characteristics of expertise for teaching higher education. Uh, that you have done, uh, one was the uh, pedagogical content knowledge, or the, the artistry of teaching, and the third one was the professional learning. So, I want some more uh, to learn about what is exactly the artistry of the teaching. So the artist, sorry, I, your sound was going, but the artistry of teaching. Yeah, so. I want to learn something more about the artistry of mm. teaching from yourself. Can you share some experience from yourself? Yeah, of course. So um, the actual idea of artistry first came to me um, when I was being observed. Um, so we have a, a process of peer observation um, and we give each other feedback. Um, and. I hadn't, when I came to, to UE, I previously hadn't been observed for a very long time. So it was a really useful opportunity to, to hear someone else's perspective 
on what I was doing as a teacher. Uh, it happened to be online teaching that I was doing at the time. Um, but the person observing noticed how, um, whilst I did have a, a good structure and it was organised, how I was also able to respond to not just questions, but difficulties um, and um, un perhaps unexpected things that were going on um, in, within the session, which made me start thinking about there's a, something you hear around improvisation and good teaching is not just about giving a presentation, um, you know, sort of putting the knowledge in someone's head. It's not that easy. And um, there's got to be some sort of interaction. And however well prepared you are, there's always going to be questions and situations that that are going to arise. And I can remember when I when I very first started uh, in my career, um, when I say, you know, what are your strengths and weaknesses in, in the job interview? And I said, from my weakness point of view, I'm very nervous of presenting. So teaching is, is something that would be, you know, I, I really want to do, but I'm quite nervous of doing that. But after many years of experience, um, whilst I'm still not necessarily completely relaxed all the time because you never know what's going to happen, but I've developed um, without really thinking about it, strategies to be able to react. Um, I've, I've generally had most of the questions that I'll ever get. Um, and I've, I've developed new knowledge and I've learned from other people. So when I get a question um, or something happens, I can draw from that quite quickly. So it's about that kind of improvisation. So that started me thinking about, OK, so there's something more going on here than just simply knowing um, good teaching techniques. Um, there's something else I've developed, um, a way of a way of teaching that you can't necessarily learn from uh, a book about teaching. So I started exploring that a bit further. And um, I've, there's quite a few people now that have been doing some work around um, performing and teaching as performing. So not in, sen in the sense of, of acting and not being yourself, but in the sense that it's, um, it's, part, it's a particular part of your persona. So when, you as a, when you're being you as a teacher, it's probably a different you than maybe when you're with your family or with your friends. It's all you, but it's a slightly different persona. So this idea of performing and improvisation is just us developing our personas as teachers. And we'll all be very different. Even if we're using the same teaching techniques, we'll all be, you know, have different approaches. So this is that idea of artistry of teaching. So it's it's quite intangible. It's not necessarily something you can say this is exactly what it looks like, but you know you know it when you see it. And as I said, you know, it's that sense of um, you know, I think I think some people put in the chat box some really nice things. You know, you experience it as a student, as you know, you feel welcome, you feel um, you feel that you're valued. You can ask questions. Um, and the person, the teacher, is going to respond to them. Um, so it's, it's really hard to kind of say exactly what it is, but I think it's a really important aspect of teaching that we need to think about, because it, particularly when we're supporting newer teachers, because um, when you're new, you're, you know, you're probably just focusing on, you know, here's, here's the, here's how I, you know, here's the stuff I'm telling you. Um, but actually, we all know that, that teaching is much more complex than that. So I think just by surfacing the idea of artistry, it helps people just think a bit more about. So what's what's my way of teaching? So um, we all obviously have role models. Many of us have role models of teachers, teachers who have inspired us in the past. And often we want to be like them. Um, but we can't always be like them because we're ourselves. So what are the best things about ourselves that we can bring to our teaching? So, for example, I'm not particularly good at telling jokes. Um, I know what I can do, um, but, you know, I don't do the same thing that, that other people can do really well. Uh, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a number of jokes fall, fall flat, very flat. Um, other people um, can, might be much more dynamic. Um, other people are really quiet. All of those things are absolutely fine um, because they're our authentic selves. Um, so that's the sort of thing I'm trying to get at with this idea of artistry. 
you have uh, summarized the generic uh, or general characteristics of XPs as uh, I think uh, intentional learning and development. Uh, what is exactly the intentional learning? Uh, see, as a uh, I normally uh, teach uh, programming to students, and uh, how I can develop my intentional learning as a teacher. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So it's about your own professional development. So how you how you improve your teaching. Um, but it needs to be intentional. So you need to. Um, so so. If you're not doing it, it's probably an easier way is you're just. Uh, go and teach, go away again, come back and teach again without having really thought about what you're doing each time. You'll just keep on doing the same thing without really um, changing or, or even reflecting on it. So intentional learning and development um, is about being thoughtful and mindful. So you do your teaching um, and you might think about, well, how did that go? Did my students actually learn anything? Um, what went wrong? What went well? You might um, get feedback from your students. Um, or you might think, actually, you know, this 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 was fine, but I'd be really interested to teach in a bit of a different way. Maybe do something more interactive with my students. So you're just being really thoughtful and mindful about how you're teaching, whether it works, and how you might improve it, um, rather than just mindlessly going teaching, going off and doing something else. And it's by doing that mindful development. Um, that enables you to improve and develop exp develop expertise. Uh, in the intentional learning, are there any uh, uh, fixed or uh, st static steps or any milestones that I can judge that this I have reached up this milestone, then I have to improve my this? That yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. So the answer is kind of yes, but they'll be personal to you. Um, so. Um, I, I work with our lecturers and, and uh, support them in thinking about their professional development. And I recommend that they look at things like um, if you have promotions criteria. So um, or looking at job descriptions. So let's say if you're a senior lecturer and you want to move to be a professor, um, what sort of things might you need to be doing in order to be a professor? And then you can start developing your teaching or your other activities to start moving on. Um, also, right at the beginning, Mary mentioned um, the Higher Education Academy fellowships. That's another really useful framework to look and see, well, what's the difference between a fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a senior fellow? What are the different sorts of things I need to be doing? So there's that kind, those sorts of frameworks that you can use to explore perhaps more broadly um, aspects of your teaching career and how you might develop but then in terms of just your personal teaching, really, it's kind of it's more self-defined. Um, so you might think about, um, let's say you um, you're teaching in a classroom with a large number of students and you find it really difficult uh, to get them to ask any questions. So you think, yeah, I'd, I'd really like them to be to be more interactive with me. So I'd like to improve that. So that becomes your your goal for improvement. Um, and perhaps when you've achieved that, you might think, yeah, that's all right. But there's still some of my students who are not quite understanding this. So what can I do to help more of my students to understand? And so that would be your next goal. And that's this idea of progressive problem solving. So you're kind of identifying for yourself, you know, what things you want to improve and where you want things to move. So, yeah, so two aspects to that. One is your sort of personal teaching improvement and the other is more around your career development. Um, and then what, what goals would be relevant for you there? It was quite enlightening and a great session. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Sukhan. So I think uh, Yamasa is raising hand. I can see it. Yamasa? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Helen, for your presentation. The small question that I wanted to ask you is, I mean, uh, do you know of any types of differences in culture uh, that could play a, a pivotal part I mean, uh, some of the things that may work in the West may not work, may not work in this part of the world. And some of the uh, some of the very good techniques 
uh, that work here, men that work in the West. Uh, so can you give some examples of things that work there that do not work here, or that may work here that do not work there kind of thing? So can you give some specific examples? Thank you. Thank you. Heather. That's a really good question and something I'm really, really interested in. Um, I'm not sure that I can give those sorts of specific examples, um, but I'm really keen to explore what those might be. And my, what I'm hoping is with this model of expertise that actually it, it can cut, cut across cultural boundaries because I'm not specifying what I mean by pedagogy. So how we teach here in the West might be different from elsewhere. And I'm and then what works somewhere else might not work uh, for us. So I'm not defining what that pedagogy is. Um, so um, one thing I'm hoping to do, I'm doing some work uh, with the University of Queensland and they're looking into things like indigenous pedagogies, working with um, Australian Aboriginals um, and they have a much more narrative way um, of teaching and, and, and sharing knowledge. Um, so it'd be really interesting to explore what this looks like um, for them. So, and similarly, this, this nature of, of artistry, that, that could look very different within different cultures. Um, I've talked about it very much from, from my perspective. So these, these ideas of improvisation, um, rapport, relationships and so on, that might look quite different within other cultures. But I think there probably still is some sort of artistry, some sort of authenticity that's relevant um, and professional learning um, I think is is important that might again it might look different for different cultures you might be more focused on going on a training course it might be much more about learning from others and then reflection and so on um, so this the very the specifics of what it looks like I, I would really hope looks different in different places and I think part of the purpose of this is to help people explore well what does this mean for me with my teaching and my students and my culture. Um, so I'm really sorry, I, did, I, I haven't answered your question and given you examples, but I'm so pleased you brought that up because I think it's really important that, that I'm, I don't want to impose a Western pedagogy on this or any type of pedagogy. I want people to take for it themselves and, and make meaning within their own context. So thank you very much for that, I understood. <laughs> Thank you, Yama, sir. I was actually thinking that might be a really good research topic for us to explore more. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Yama, sir. Um, I do have one, one question, if, if I may, because I wanted to continue the conversation of uh, Sukhan, sir, about the intentional learning and development, Helen. Uh, there is one, one area that I'm interested, maybe, you know, um, other colleagues can also share their experience. Um, sometimes I, 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 I try to think uh, for me as a lecturer, um, I, I try to think of uh, getting beyond my comfort zone of teaching. Um, um, I started my teaching career from directly from postgraduate student, you know, the master level student, and you know how they're different from the bachelor student. And um, I did have experience of teaching one, one section of the um, BBA uh, freshers as well. Um, but then other than that, I'm, um, I'm constantly teaching and being around with master student. And, um, and one day I realized that I got too comfortable with this crowd, you know, I, I wanted to deliberately, uh, as a part of intentional learning and development, I wanted to change the crowd and be move beyond the comfort zone. Um, so, uh, you know, is there anything that you've done for yourself to check and test your status? And you know, and uh, and how did it go? Uh, so part of my plan for me is I would I I plan to teach the student outside TBC just to see you know how they do, how they respond, you know, and how do I fit in because it will be a completely new environment for me, right? Um, so is there any experience that you can share with us that that's something that you've done de deliberately like this? Um, so yeah, I would love to hear that. Yeah, and I I think that. The whole thing about development is you do have to challenge yourself a little bit or a lot um, and that's a really interesting in, interesting way of doing it kind of teaching different types of students um, so yeah I've got an example from, from myself um, and also from a, a colleague uh, who was one of the people who um, was in my NTF research um, so for me actually it's something I'm doing at the moment so um, I'm doing some work with the Avon and Somerset police 
um, they're really interested in professional development um, and in fact in, in how to encourage motivate people to do it um, and to see it as part of um, what they should be doing every day rather than well I'll just go on a training course and tick box I've, I've done it um, so that's going to be a really interesting challenge so the, the people I'm working with at the moment um, uh, they are um, uh, that they sort of teach that they do the training for the police um, and one of them is already is doing a master's in education so so they're fine we've got you know we we talk the same language um in terms of sort of education and so on and that's going really well um what has been the real challenge um is working with the police officers themselves and talking to them and the actual the actual trainers as well who are police officers themselves it's a completely different professional culture from what i'm used to um and it feels very much like being a novice teacher again because I mentioned before about this sort of you know I've drawn on all my experience and I kind of heard most of the questions and I, I kind of most of the time I can respond fairly reasonably fluently I think um, and I've got something in the back of my mind that I can draw on in order to, to answer questions but that's always been with a higher education audience um, and so working with the police is is very different because they you know they've got completely different type of experience um and questions are similar but different and i need to draw on different experiences in order to in order to build that rapport um so and, and it's interesting being an external person um it, it's there's two aspects to it. One is sometimes people will listen to you more because you're external, uh, which is often why we bring in keynote speakers, um, because they might say the same things we've been saying, but for people tend to listen to, to um, external experts. But then you also have the problem, they say, well, you don't know who we are, you're not like us. Why is what you say relevant to us? Um, so that's been a that's been a really interesting challenge. Um, I've only done one short session with them so far, and it's it's actually been fine. They were they were really uh, really welcoming um, and and listening. But um, I think it'd be interesting that I've got another session coming up in May, which is going to be a bit longer, a bit more interactive. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see um, to to see their kind of of how it feels. And it does. And I said from my first experience, it does feel like being a novice again. Um, I was uh, much more nervous than I, than I normally am. A, a similar second anecdote, as I said, is from one of my National Teaching Fellows who I interviewed. Um, and they had um, a similar experience, but uh, within higher education context, where they had to cover for another colleague who was ill. Um, normally they teach undergraduate students, um, but they had to then teach a professional development course for um, professionals. So um, I'm trying to remember what field it was it was um i think it was some it was a medical field possibly psychiatry i think but basically they had professionals coming in to to have uh, to be developed uh to come come on this course and she was used to teaching students um and she said you know from her point of view she felt again she it was like being a novice again she was doing the same things but people were asking different sorts of questions um and um, and because they were they were professionals, they were also being they were asking more questions. Um, so, so I say I think it's a really really good thing to challenge yourself to try something a bit different, um, have the opportunity to work with different people, teach different people. Um, it will feel strange and unusual because um, you you quite quickly settle in to working with the same sorts of people. Um, and so suddenly, if you've got a very different audience, it can feel very different. Um, but remember that kind of artistry aspect, be welcoming, have that rapport um, and, um, and and listen. I think that's a really important thing as well. I think, you know, again, someone put that in the chat box, you know, know your audience. If you can't know them in advance, get to know them whilst you're teaching, you know, listen to, to what they're saying, give them opportunities to share their perspectives. Um, but, but well for doing that and I hope it goes all right. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um
Um, is there anybody who would like to uh, ask and share their insights? I have a question rather than uh, an insight. Okay. Um, it is more from a perspective of uh, management, British College, rather than uh, from you know teaching. Personally, I think we've covered a lot on that. Um, so at British College, we get a lot of a range of you know teaching faculty with a range of experience, right? So we've got teachers who are novice, of just starting out their teaching careers, uh, and we also have faculties who have you know fifteen years plus um, teaching experience. So from the perspective of the college, what kind of faculty development um, support can the college provide for this you know, range um, you know, of uh, experience, experience that we have in terms of faculties here? That's, that's a really good question. So <coughs> um, there are some models of the development of expertise um, which can be, can be quite useful here. Um, and um with people who are, are very new actually formal courses uh formal training you know short workshops um is a really helpful way to, to for them to learn um, they can learn from an experienced colleague um, they can talk with each other um, we can share ideas about you know what works um what are appropriate pedagogies and so on so having some sort of formal development i think is, is really useful for, for people who are new um, and certainly at UE, we have a course that all of our new lecturers go on um, and they do find it really beneficial. Um, they, uh, we, we have to give them time to do that. Um, that's one of the major difficulties is trying to find enough time because um, we, you know, they've obviously got very, very busy doing the teaching. But it's really important that we help them to do that. Um, LinkedIn with that formal course, we have mentoring. So they have a, a, a mentor that they can talk to about their teaching and other aspects of, of their role in higher education. Um, as you move to more experienced staff, um, sometimes things like short workshops can be really useful, particularly if it's something very new for them. So if you're introducing some new technology um, or in, you know, in the case um, a couple of years ago when we had the, um, the first pivot to online teaching because of the pandemic, um, we did a lot of kind of very short um, courses on, on how to, to teach online um, and because it, it was at a time when people had to change they had to do something different they were very receptive to that and they was like you know, please help me you know they, they came along to those those short sessions but actually for more experienced staff if it isn't sort of um, a change topic like that just sharing ideas learning from each other is, is seems to work really well so opportunities uh, to have kind of communities of practice where they can just share, well, this is what I do and it seems to work. Um, or where they can sort of talk with each other, um, discuss problems they might have. So much more um, about having conversations around teaching and, and facilitating those sort of conversations. Um, that often works as well. The other thing that I found is really useful is um, embedding professional development into um, processes and things that you're doing anyway. So it doesn't feel like it's something I have to do separately. What we do at UWE when people are designing new courses uh, or if they're having formal periodic review for a course, um, we have um, a colleague from our academic practice directorate will work with the programme team to help them develop the course. Um, and so where there are areas that they perhaps need some help with, we can be there to support that. So they can learn as part of the process of developing their course. So it's, it's not additional work for them, um, but they are you know, having that professional development that's embedded within practice. So there's a, a few ideas um, that I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah? Uh, do you follow uh, Bloom's taxonomy in UV? We we do use it to, um, to help people when they're they're doing things like writing learning outcomes and thinking about um, sort of development of a progression through the different years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 very useful um, as a way to think about. Um, in fact, it's something we can you know use for ourselves in our own professional learning. Um, and it does, in a way, it kind of links to that 
sort of development of ju from just doing your knowledge and skills to developing that artistry. Um, but yeah, it is something we use uh, in lots of different contexts. Right. Um, yeah, if if there is no more question, I have a couple more <laughs> because I, I was noting down a couple more areas of my interest, Helen. Uh, again, coming back to this deliberate, uh, you know, uh, practice of continuous professional development journey, uh, I was thinking about the importance of a feedback, you know, a continuous feedback, uh, you know, as much as we'd like to plan things for ourselves, for our personal and professional development journey, we also have to be aware and mindful of the fact that we get feedback from externals, from our colleagues, you know, from people around us. Um, uh, what has worked for you really for, for your own teaching experience? Um, at CBC, we try to use number of uh, feedback mechanism, you know, for teacher, there are feedbacks from student, there are feedbacks from management in terms of peer observations, there's peer to peer learning mechanism. Um, you know, there are also opportunities uh, to directly talk with the module leader from, from the university itself. Uh, you know, my question basically comes down to the point of when we are planning our own set of development activities, how do we check ourselves? You know, how do we make sure that, okay, you know, things are working well, things are not working well. well what's, what's your experience on this? Um, very similar to the things that you've been talking about. And I think it's, it's really important to get a whole range of different perspectives so you can kind of triangulate so self-reflection I think is really important so thinking for yourself you know well what what's working what's not working um, getting feedback from peers that can be through peer observation um, but also if, just talking through something so you can have kind of feedback in advance if you like so you come up with a, a lesson plan for example and you just want to talk it through with somebody see if that's going to work um, and then you might talk to them again afterwards and sort of say, you know, reflect on well, did it work or not and, and, and so on. Uh, as you say, feedback from students. Um, we do that in a couple of different ways. One is very formal. We have a survey at the end of each module. Um, I'm not sure there's, I don't know of many places that have been successful with those sorts of things. Uh, and and if, if you know of anyone that can uh, has been successful I'd love to know uh, it's really difficult getting people to respond um, you know they've completed their module and that's it they want to move on and do something else we have exactly the same thing if we're doing sort of surveys on conferences and events and uh, I mentioned before about how we behave as learners when we're in that situation I'm guilty myself of not always completing feedback surveys when I'm asked to so formal surveys can be useful but I wouldn't rely on them um, there they can be some useful insights, but if you don't get a good response rate, then it's obviously not necessarily going to be um, generalizable. But sometimes you get some really useful, useful ones. What I find more useful is to do something a bit more informal, actually in, in the classroom. Um, if we were face to face, um, I'd probably use things like post-it notes or just ask people to, to note down comments, um, you know, what you know, what do you, uh, I think our classic one we share is stop, start, continue. So what do you want me to stop doing, start doing and continue doing? Just really quick things like that. And if you're actually doing it within the context, um, people tend to respond. So it becomes a bit more meaningful. Um, and I think also because you're there with them I and mean, you can do it anonymously, either using paper or using a um, technology like Mentimeter, for example, we use. But the fact you're there with them, I think people tend to be more constructive um, whereas sometimes, you know, if, if they're just answering it afterwards, sometimes you get sort of flippant comments um, and perhaps not quite so useful ones. Um, so, yeah, feedback from peers, feedback from students um, and yourself. And as you said, you know, external examiners, um, those sorts of things, all of these different things, I think, are really useful because you can then triangulate from them and get an overall sense of, of what's going on. What's really important, though, and I think is, is something that's really difficult, is trying not to get too focused on the negative comments, um, because it, I think it's human nature to, you know, you might have 20 lovely comments and constructive ideas for how things might be better, and then one negative comment, and that's the one that you remember. 
Um, so particularly as a as a newer teacher, I'd sort of highly recommend look at it all together. Don't just focus on that one that makes you feel bad um, and do that triangulation. Get a kind of a, a sense from a number of different angles about what you're doing. Um, but um, but yeah, I don't think I've got any other sort of anything different than than what you've already been looking at. Sure, sure, absolutely. But I can totally, uh, you know, totally agree and share the mutual feeling on this response rate and, you know, and the confusion about, uh, you know, how to analyze this uh, five responses out of 30. <laughs> so that is definitely there. Uh, we've been there and trying to, trying to come up with, you know, you know, um, what to do, what to do about that. Uh, right. Uh, and there is one, one, looks like pretty much the last but not least question from not question a comment from my side Helen I was very uh, intrigued uh, when you when you when you shared uh, in your first presentation about um, you know uh, in terms of doing job well as expert you need to be able to use um, you know others expertise as well uh, it's not only about you yourself developing on your expertise but also be able to use some somebody else experts to make it more cohesive work. Um, I am interested to know as somebody who is into the role of lecturer and a manager, uh, you know, um, in, in the School of Business at TBC, uh, how, how, how can we, uh, you know, have and establish this cohesive relationship between academic and non-academic uh, department and still be able to work together uh, for a same level of uh, goal, you know, uh, it doesn't expertise. I know we're talking about developing expertise in teaching in higher education, but then teacher, professor, lecturer themselves, they do need help from, you know, non-academic people, non-functional department. Um, so what's your experience been in that, in that area? Um, so any, any insights? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so, in my previous institution, um, there was very much the sense that the academics were the experts in teaching. And we were there, to, so, so I worked in, in, I was head of academic staff development. Uh, we ran courses for, for new lecturers. We facilitated development around teaching. Um, and I think there was a sense that we were there more as, as people who, organized things so we put on a conference or we organized a course and our own expertise wasn't recognized um, and that felt really uncomfortable um, so and there were a number of times where people saying oh we need you know we need experts in this to come you know to, to help the teaching they say well and that's the academics like, but we have an expertise as well um, and so I, I found that quite uncomfortable it, it didn't enable us to do our work as well as we could at UWE, um, it's very it feels very different. Um, it does feel like uh, everyone's expertise is recognised. Um, so again, I'm I'm based within professional services, um, but um, uh, academic staff kind of welcome our input, um, and similarly also have colleagues who work within careers and employability, who work in the library, um, and they are welcomed by majority I would say of academic colleagues um, and it's recognised we you've got this knowledge and understanding that I don't have um, I think for us certainly the last few years it's there's been a number of key issues that have really helped with that um, so we're doing a lot of work around inclusivity um, particularly um, in response to Black Lives Matter um, and issues around racism and so on um, we're looking at aspects of decolonizing the curriculum um, and some things that are are really out of many people's com comfort zones. Um, you know, they may be expert teachers in, in their field, but actually there's this whole new area that's come in. And so I think that's enabled a bringing together of expertise because people just say, yeah, I'm, I really don't know what to do here. Please come and help me. So that necessity has kind of ha has helped with that. Um, but it is, um, I think it is a cultural wide thing and it is something that we've heard from um, vice chancellor and deputy vice chancellor and pro vice chancellors saying you know expertise is important we need to to use it you know and bring it in where, where it's relevant and interestingly we include students in that so students have their own expertise as students 
they know better than we do what it's like to be a student. So it's really important that we bring in them to the conversation as well. Um, but it is it is a wide cultural thing and it is different in different universities. How, how you enable it if it's not there. Um, I think partly it, it is just through explicit conversation saying and acknowledging what's the expertise that different people bring um, and saying, well, you know, if, if we're designing this new program, we absolutely need the academics because they're the experts in their subject area. They're the experts at, at teaching that area. But we also need to bring in uh, some learning technologists because we want some uh, to use more online teaching or um, <clears throat> actually, you know, feedback from students say the teaching could be could be improved. So maybe we can find someone who's got some expertise in that. So it, it's it's yeah, it, it's that acknowledgement that we don't all hold everything and we can't all hold all the knowledge. Um, so just keep talking about it, I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think the way around is to continue the conversation on this topic to to people of all the fields uh, uh, so that so that, you know, it can continue. Uh, right. Uh, anyone has any 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 questions, comments, insights, anybody? We do have uh, we can we can take this uh, 10 more minutes and then we can we can wrap it up if you'd like. Well, people are thinking, I just wanted to come back to the question around cultures. Um, and I think that's that's really interesting and really important. Um, and, you know, you mentioned as a possible uh, joint project or something, but genuinely, I think that that would be great. It'd be really interesting to look at. I've got a number of number of contacts internationally. Um, I've had colleagues from uh, China also contributing to the book. Um, and uh, it would be really interesting to kind of get some different perspectives on you know, what does this look like from different cultures. Um, I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. So uh, just to kind of <laughs> put that out there as a, as a possibility. Sure, absolutely. Um, Nisha, my colleague, uh, program leader of masses, and I, we are involved in one of the research project with UE itself. And you know, um, like you said, as aspiring academician, we keep on try. You know, we, our our effort, our intentional effort is try and find the research topic in every thing. <laughs> every time we go down for a coffee, we try to say, "Oh, okay, this is a research topic. That is a research topic." So I think today we found one. Thanks to Yamon sir. Um, so it looks like we might be interested uh, to talk more about this with uh, with Helen and more our faculty members here. Uh, Helen, we'll, we'll keep you updated. <laughs> Excellent, that sounds good. And I, I love the idea of, of everything being a research topic because I think that's that's something I particularly um, with colleagues who are research more research focused. So kind of use that curiosity to within your teaching as well. You know, Absolutely. sort of how can we find out more about what we're doing in our teaching um, whether it's just me individually getting feedback or whether it's a, a you know a full-on research project but it's just all about being curious and interested about things yeah absolutely and in, in while we're talking about research Helen you know um, uh, again from the side of a lecturer um, well it, it well it is it is without a doubt that you, when you are in a teaching uh, the the fact that you should be getting into the research and you should be getting into the you know, uh, your own de pro professional development is without a doubt, uh, it, it's, it's a must. Um, but again, um, like you said, it's it's such a struggle for academician and management to find the time um, to research and dedicate their time for a research because it's a lot of work, right? Um, how, you know, how, how do you get around with it? You know, how have you managed? Because You've, you've been involved in a lot of fellowships and a lot of collaborations. Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your tips for, for people like us? Um, gosh, uh, I, suppose, uh, I suppose I've got involved in a lot of things just because I'm interested in a lot of things. Um, so that's, that's, I suppose it comes back to motivation, doesn't it? If, if you're interested and motivated, then you do find ways to, to make the time. I think it's also to do with, I suppose there's the expertise aspect of it as well. So I mentioned this idea of progressive problem solving. And um, that's based on the fact that as you become more experienced, you get that automation of skills. And that automation frees up time and cognitive space to do other things. And I think that's probably the case for me as well. Um, it's the first time I've really thought about it in these terms. Um, 
you know, when I first started my my job, I, so I was um, project manager for a, a staff development project. Um, so I was managing the project and I was learning about teaching and teaching others about teaching um, all at the same time. And um, and over time, I got more uh, confident and I understood some things better. And so I spent less time um, on some aspects of my role, which freed up more time to do other things. So I think some of it is that is particularly when you're a newer teacher, you're probably spending a lot of time preparing for your lessons and, and uh, partly that's about confidence. If you're nervous, the more nervous you are, the more kind of tightly controlled you want to, want it to be. Um, <coughs> and, and similarly with research, you know, you, you're spending, it takes a lot of time to write um, a bid, uh, a proposal, for example, as you become more experienced, more expert, those sorts of things you can do more quickly and that frees up more time. So that's one aspect of it. I think why I've managed to fit, fit things in. Um, because I'm interested in it. Um, I find it exciting. Um, I'm not sure if I've got any top tips for time management, but um, but yeah, just I think just stay curious and be interested and um, get involved with things. Um, and I found that, that you know it does it does seem to to fit together. Maybe I've just been lucky. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There are no any tips for time management. Absolutely, um, right. Uh, any if anybody has any any question uh, because i can see the time it's almost 3 40 um if not then i'm happy to um wrap wrap the session up uh, please let me know okay all right um dr helen what a pleasure to have you uh in this session uh you know i already have like four pages of notes and i'm sure all the faculty members have the same uh, this is, uh, of, of course, like I shared with you, it's a part of our very small faculty development plan. We do our objective and, and aim, you know, our one of our aim is to uh, is to um, um, have everybody together in a table and offer an environment where we can we can have conversation like this. Uh, you know, we've managed to start very small. We've managed to do a couple of reflection session on the School of uh, Business and uh, apparently it went very well where people were very comfortable, you know, share their bit of ideas, their experiences. And uh, from there itself, I think uh, we managed to come up with a lot of action points. And um, likewise, this is also a session where we invited all the faculty members to, to be here in this session to get the experience and learning from you so that they can actually add things on for their own development and plannings. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for this uh, uh, insightful uh, comment, observation, and opportunity to have us in this discussion. Um, I, I really hope that we can continue such session with you further. Um, um, we are looking into a couple of plans to collaborate with UE, especially the academic practice department, which is under your leadership, uh, to have more uh, activities like this in future. I will. I'll be in touch with you and um, and thank you so much again, Dr. Helen. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I always enjoy talking about this, but what I enjoy even more is, is the questions and the, and the discussion and the insights. So thank you so much to, to you and everybody else for coming along. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And thank you to all the faculty members and uh, um, our associate deans and uh, program leaders here who are here with us. Thank you for your participation. Uh, we'll see you in next session. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Have a thank wonderful you, evening. Thank you, thank you very oh, much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.